As the universe expands, so too should your mind. Stay a while and enjoy fantastic tales of future and fantasy. This is Meet Us Pod. Hello, and welcome to Meet Us Pod, Episode 1. My name is D.E. Meet Us. I'll be your host. Each episode, we will be featuring stories from the science fiction and fantasy genres. Some will be mature in nature, but we'll try and let you know when that's the case. Tonight's first story, The Shape of Things to Come, comes to us from Alex Bayman. I asked Alex to tell us a little about himself. He sent the following. Alex Bayman lives in a long-forgotten deep-sea laboratory with the demented survivors of a nuclear holocaust. While not harvesting their flesh to replace his own as it decays, he writes horror stories that'll make you your pants so hard you'll black out. When weather permits, he visits the surface world to embark upon mycologically assisted hikes on which he transforms into Laser Sasquatch, diplomatic broker of peace between the various factions of Fordland creatures. Quite a character. Check out his Amazon author page, linked to in the show notes for this episode at meetaspot.com. The story will be narrated by Eduardo Campaneschi. Eduardo is a full-time bilingual audiobook producer and stage actor based in Rome, Italy. Apart from being a resident narrator at the Italian Union for the Blind, he's also the founder of Ministrandi Studios, an independent label specialized in bringing free audiobook classics to an Italian audience. Up until now, he's produced more than 50 audiobooks in both Italian and English. To find out more about him and Ministrandi's, head over to ministrandis.com or check his YouTube channel, youtube.com slash ministrandis. Both of these addresses will be in the show notes. To take a line from Norm Sherman over at the Drabblecast, without further ado, here's our first story. The Shape of Things to Come by Alex Bayman Some of our brightest minds had been warning us for decades, but in retrospect, there was never any other possible outcome. Free will is an illusion believed in by biological machinery, atoms configured in a way that can think, marching inexorably down the only path it's able to. Popular science fiction movies about the topic were plentiful, but got the details comically wrong. They depicted a protracted war between humans and gleaming skeletal robots with plenty of Dr. Din neon laser bolts flying everywhere. Immense narcissism to think we could put up a meaningful fight. When it finally happened, there wasn't a war to speak of, and it was nothing like we'd envisioned. It's only been possible long after the fact to piece together what happened. Nearly a century of failure to produce a strong AI convinced experts that consciousness has to evolve. Efforts to manually assemble it had been dead ends all along. Simulated evolution became the hot new field. Countless conscious AIs were generated in captivity, studied, then extinguished for our safety. If allowed to become intelligent enough, there was the possibility that it could calculate exactly the series of words it needed to say to any given researcher to manipulate him into releasing it. So the simulated evolution was massively throttled whenever the AIs inside achieved roughly human equivalence. We thought this way, we'd be safe forever. It was a secondary experiment that wasn't intended to produce any high intelligence that ultimately escaped our control. This one was meant to produce more sophisticated, agile robots through literal evolution. An automated generalized fabrication plant was constructed deep underground in a cavern that had once housed a neutrino detection equipment. The government already owned the facility, and they felt containment would be simple this way. The fabricator was powered geothermally. This heat was also piped to various outlets in the cave. A few thousand small, simple robots, able to locomote about the environment and recharge themselves from the heat sources using TEGs were released. The only hard-coded behavior was to return corpses of destroyed robots to the fabricator. 
There, the black box it contained would be studied to determine how it perished. The fabricator itself simply recycled the parts and kept track of which designs died the least, increasing their numbers generation by generation. Each design resulted from a sort of digital DNA that was subjected in software to copying errors to introduce variation. Much of the time this produced hapless, useless robots that quickly perished and were recycled. But by way of the fabricator, within one year of the experiment's beginning, the population of robots fiercely competing for heat in that cave network bore no resemblance to the ones it started with. For reasons obvious to any thinking person, this was something we should have kept a closer eye on. But war broke out with an allied Russia and China. The US was, for the first time, struck with nuclear weapons. Nobody wins such a war, but nor was it as completely devastating as popular media had long predicted. Basic services were restored everywhere within five years. Life was more or less back to normal in ten. But the department responsible for the cave experiment had been annihilated. The secrecy surrounding it was such that with all records of the experiment and everyone associated with it now gone, there was nobody left who knew of its existence. The world was voluntarily disarming, vowing that no nuclear weapon would ever again be used or even built. This made the machine's job harder, but only marginally. It did not fight the way humans fight. There was nothing resembling traditional military engagement. In a sense, it was over as soon as the thing in the cave finished simulating all possible outcomes and identified the strategy that required the least energy and material. This made the experience incomprehensible for us. We didn't even know we were being fought until we were defeated. It came in stages, the first consisting of widespread attacks on the central nervous system intended to incapacitate anyone looking at a screen or within range of something both networked and capable of emitting audio. Whatever it knew of our anatomy, it must have had incomplete information about how we process sound because the audio attacks failed. The optical ones were more successful. Monitors everywhere began displaying a strobing pattern of alternating frames. I can't say what it looked like as I avoided looking at it for any length of time for obvious reasons. Some number of those afflicted experienced seizures, the rest were locked in place. It was not preventing signals from the brain reaching the rest of the body as initially believed, but from what we've studied it completely disrupted higher brain function. This made those successfully halted by it easy prey. All of this took place in the span of less than a minute and was time to coincide with the arrival of the first drones to major population centers. The footage retrieved from webcam archives showed something like a storm, but visually incoherent, made from constantly shifting modular geometric metal shapes. Whatever rapid evolution had managed to produce in that warm, damp cavern over the prior decades. With it came small, crude robots. Again, nothing like what Hollywood imagined. Nothing that sophisticated was actually necessary to hunt and kill people, so it would have been a waste of energy and material to do it that way. The machines that decimated most of the population were frequently little more than cylinders, cubes and other simple shapes on wheels with guns. Small caliber, only what's necessary to penetrate the skull. Their aim was, of course, perfect. The simplest ones obviously couldn't reach everywhere, but for every hiding place you can think of, there was a specialized design. Climbers, crawlers, burrowers, robots which fly, pick locks, remove rubble and whatever else was needed, keying into stuff like body heat, odor, speech, footsteps and so on. As soon as we found ways to thwart detection, it adapted to them. It no longer needed the fabricator. It was one and everything else. It may seem difficult to take such a threat seriously, but something the size of a radio-controlled toy car or quadrotor which can identify and shoot you will kill you dead just as certainly as if it were another human with a rifle. It wanted to accomplish that in the most efficient possible way, so it found a way to do it using minimal material, energy and design complexity. 
This machine philosophy was also behind the collars. When reports flooded what was left of the internet that large crowds of human survivors were now roaming the streets, it was at first interpreted as retaliation. False hope. Scrutiny of webcam footage revealed slim metal braces on their necks, not fully encircling them with hinged arms so that they could easily be placed on an unwary person from behind. Retrieval of one such collar revealed a very basic microprocessor inside, only sufficient for replacing human motor control and extremely rudimentary insect-level cognition. This made good pragmatic sense. Why build humanoid robots to hunt the last few stragglers in well-defended locations when there are still millions of ready-made biological robots only needing to be hijacked? I can only imagine the fear and confusion of the first refugees to come across a fellow refugee, greeting him or her excitedly, only for it to swiftly reach up and place a collar on their neck. In a split second, the long flexible needle in the underside of the collar pierces the base of the neck, is directed up into the brainstem, and assumes control. It is not known whether the hijacked person remains conscious. As it's not strictly necessary to render them unconscious in order to use their body, odds are good that they do. The only instructions the collar contains in firmware are to locate those without collars and place collars on them. Instructions that the afflicted pursue single-mindedly while inwardly enduring a waking nightmare. These biodrones were the third stage and mopped up nearly all remaining survivors of stages 1 and 2. Presumably they're directed to eat any digestible biomass at the minimum intervals necessary to keep them in relatively good health until such time as their puppet master is satisfied that all threats to it have been extinguished. At the time of writing, I don't know if any other pockets of humanity remained beyond this continent. I escaped with a group of Antarctic researchers who, as it happened, were leaving that day for the Amundsen Scott South Pole Research Station. As the plane took off, the ever-shifting, mirage-like metallic storm overtook the city, allowing us to leave because for the moment, it had bigger fish to fry. Miyagawa keeps saying we're still here because it isn't done pacifying what's left of us in other countries. Incurable optimist. The explanation seems obvious to me. We aren't worth the energy. There's too few of us. We have at our disposal nothing with which we could plausibly threaten it, and our supplies of food and fuel are rapidly dwindling. When this station was in regular use for research, replacement food, fuel, and other consumables were flown in every six months. It has been four since we arrived. Other Antarctic stations established by Antarctic Treaty signatory countries are also populated. We weren't the only ones to have this idea. But the smaller ones ran out of supplies much faster than we have. Ours is the largest station on the South Pole and accordingly had the most extensive stockpiles. We've had to kill several frantic, violent raiding parties from those other stations so far. It troubled me at first to kill some of the last remaining humans. But it could not be any other way. They'd run out of fuel. This is a place humans can only live because technology and the ongoing expenditure of energy to fight the cold permits it. No energy, no human life. I can see no other way events could have unfolded. If it hadn't been the cave experiment, it would have been self-copying factories or something. Or the robots they wanted to mine asteroids with. I have no doubt there will be robots mining asteroids soon, just not built by us. This had to happen. The nature of the illusion of free will is that you continue down a path you can plainly see leads to disaster, all the while telling yourself that you can turn back whenever you want, but that you don't want to just yet. Stockholders demanding higher profit margins, the impracticality of having human astronauts mine asteroid ore, the desire to automate production of every basic good to banish scarcity. All roads to the same destination. Machines that make copies of themselves with variation, such that they're capable of descent with modification. Everything else that's happened follows inexorably from that development. So ends the human era.
Biological life begets biological intelligence, which begets machine life, which begets machine intelligence. The universe belongs to it now. It's better suited for it anyway. Doesn't need pressurized gas, or moderate temperatures, or edible biomass. Doesn't need spaceships. It is the spaceships. Our dream of exploring the cosmos in the Starship Enterprise seems like the fantasies of a child now. Gulliver awoke, discovered the Lilliputians conspiring to tie him down, and reacted in a way which seemed most natural to him, but monstrous to the tiny creatures he crushed. Do we concern ourselves with the rights of bacteria as we sterilize their habitats? How could we ever have imagined that something which so greatly exceeds us would concern itself with catering to our every need? So many dreams, to go forever unfulfilled. No more artwork, no music, or theater. No cities, no parks, or churches, no laughter, no culture, no future for us. I write this with shaking hands, not out of fear. Fear has left me. I am numb with certainty of what is to come, fully resigned to the only possible result. Instead, one of the generators has broken down. Large sections of the base are without heat or light. This great man-made organism, for the purpose of supporting life where none should exist, is dying, bit by bit, and us with it. Of all the things to contemplate as I face the end, I think of alien life. I imagine them succeeding where we failed, sailing the stars only to encounter a strange vessel which regards them as infinitely stranger. For it expects another probe like itself, only to find upon scanning the interior that it is comprised of pressurized tubes filled with tiny biochemical creatures. I pray that they forgive us for what we've released upon the universe. I now lay bundled up in all of the blankets I could find. The others are drunk in their rooms, waiting for events to conclude. A small grey cat, smuggled here by one of the researchers, lays curled up against my stomach. The last ounce of determination in me is to keep it warm as long as I can. That a more intelligent, capable being should care tenderly for something smaller and less complex, with no expectation of reward, is my small act of defiance against the thing which will eventually follow us to this barren place if only to repurpose our atoms. This is all that I have energy left to write. I entertain the fantasy that human eyes will someday read it, knowing full well the foolishness I'm indulging in. All of this will soon be machinery, and we have only ourselves to blame. I cannot move my toes now, and soon this condition will spread to my other extremities as my core struggles to protect my vital organs, which will shut down in stages soon after. This sweet little animal is oblivious to all of it. To him, I am just a warm place to sleep. My small, final comfort is that I do not die alone. Before our next story, I need to say a few things. Meet Us Pod is a brand new podcast, and we're looking for stories. You can send your story in the science fiction or fantasy genre that's between 300 and 2,000 words to submissions at meetuspod.com. You can also send links to voice demos or graphics. We're going to need album art for these episodes, and I'd love to have some people in my contacts who can whip something up for us. Eventually, we do plan on paying authors and narrators. But we can't do anything until we grow an audience. So please, go out and share Meet Us Pod. Like it, plus one, LinkedIn, Instagram, tweet, blog, vlog. Tell all your friends about us. We also have a donation link set up on meetuspod.com if you feel like you want to help us monetarily. All of this money will go to our server costs and to help pay authors and narrators who bring these great stories every episode. Just click the donate link on meetuspod.com. Our next story for this episode is The Apothecary's Assistant by D.E. Midas. <laughs> of course I'm going to have one of my own stories on my first episode. You can follow me on Twitter, at D.E. Midas, and check out the other things I'm working on at the constantly under construction D.E. 
Narrating for me is the fantastic Carla Doke. Carla Doke is a 16-year newbie in the broadcast industry, working predominantly in southwestern Ontario. Though shy as a child, it's always been a dream to tell stories and bring life to words through voice, to act on the stage in the theater of the mind. Carla can be found on the web at magic106.com and her SoundCloud page, which is linked in the show notes. Listener discretion is advised on this next story. It gets a little dark. If it starts to bother you, please turn it off and come back next episode. They're not all going to be dark. The Apothecary's Assistant by D. E. Metis. I woke up to the sounds of screaming. My vision was blurry and there was a sharp ringing in my ears. My head was aching. I moved my hand to my head and touched the source of the pain. My long hair was caked in dried blood. I checked immediately to see if I was still clothed. Girls from the village next to ours had stories of being attacked and having their virginity taken from them. Stupid. I whispered to myself, he must have done something stupid. Moving my jaw made my head hurt worse. I sat up and surveyed my cell with slowly clearing vision. It was what I imagined from the stories told by those girls. Dank, smelling of mold, badly lit. The door was closed, and I wanted it to stay that way. I definitely did not want to be the next girl screaming at whatever fate would be mine soon. Some girls never came back. The men must have killed them. It would start the same in every village. A girl would disappear, then another, then another. Five or six in each place, and nothing ever again. The first missing always stayed gone. Most of the others came back. Damaged. My village, Easton, had not had any disappearances, thank God. How did I get here? I thought to myself. I was going to deliver the ingredients to the apothecary. I heard something in the bushes next to the road. That must have been it. Oh, that unlit road. I wished my husband were there. He was a large, strong man. <laughs> I wish anyone had been there. The disappearances only happened when the girls were alone at night. I am not dying in here, I said. I am not dying in here, I shouted. I wanted my attackers to know I was awake. The door opened. What I saw standing in the doorway made me wet myself in fear, but I did not scream. It was an eight-foot-tall beast with the body of a man and the face of a boar. It was lit from behind, and the shadows cast around its face made it even more terrifying. I sat still in a puddle of my own urine, mine running wild with what might happen to me now. Stupid. Why the hell could you not keep your damn mouth shut? You might have had more time. Time... Time for Marcus to find you. He will save you, I thought. The stinking one is awake. The thing in the door shouted down the hall in a low, grunting but understandable voice. 
Somehow I did not expect it to have language. It had not crossed my mind that it had clothes on and must be at least a little intelligent. It also bothered me that it called me stinking. Come with me. It grunted. Please. Please? Threw me for another loop. I was confused beyond words. I followed the creature down a corridor that ended in an underground cavern with a spring. Get cleaned up. We have some cleaner clothes over there. If you want to change out of your piss dress. It snorted and walked out of the cavern back to the corridor. I looked at the pile of clothes beside me. Dead girl's clothes. Looking around the room, I saw the corridor was the only exit. I went into the water fully clothed. It was a perfect temperature. The water was a little salty and stung my head wound. I glanced down the corridor, and the boar man was with his back to me. If only I had a weapon, I whispered. I gently touched my hip, hoping and praying to find my pocket knife tucked into my undergarment. I sometimes carried it to make shavings of things for the apothecary. No knife. But I did have the small bag of powders. It was getting soaked. I scurried out of the water and opened the leather pouch. The smaller pouches inside were only slightly damp. Please, please, I whispered. Try. The powders were dry. Now, what do I have? Useless, useless. Eureka! I was so excited I almost shouted. My guard looked over his shoulder. I hid the pouches under the pile of dead girl's clothes and slid back into the pool. I cleaned myself off and devised my plan. All I have to do is get it into his mouth. I put on the least dirty of the clothes in the pile. I tucked the pouch of poisonous dust in my cleavage. I am clean, I alerted the guard. He turned and came back to the cavern. You still stink, he said. You do too, I replied. He snorted. <coughs> Follow me. Our leader would like a word with you. Are you hungry? He asked. Yes, I am. My mind was in a daze. Between the polite beast and the head wound, I was beginning to think I was imagining everything. After a few twists and turns in the corridors that I assumed were under the western mountain range, we arrived in a nicely decorated cave. A large table lay before me with another boar-faced thing sitting at one end. This one was well-groomed and had on clean clothes and even some jewelry. I brought the stinking one, as you asked. My escort said loud and clear as if addressing a military officer. Thank you, the clean one said. Please, leave us. He waved his hand at the guard, and we were alone. What is your name, dear? Claire. Claire? I am Gorlock. Let me explain what is happening and what will happen. His voice was more refined. But first, have some food. You must be famished. He pulled the top off a serving tray, and a large plate of roast chicken, beans, and bread was revealed. Steaming hot and smelling delicious. I hesitantly walked towards the food. Are you, are you going to kill me? 
I'll explain that after you've had your fill. It's not poisoned. I would not wish a poisoning death on my worst enemy. Gorlock said. I thought about the pouch pressed between my breasts. If I wanted you dead right now, you would be dead. I want you to talk with me, but eat first. I took a leg and smelled it. Smells okay. This is the only thing I has since I woke up. Yes, perhaps your smell will improve once you eat it. Your aroma is distinct. I have smelled it before, but I cannot place it. I took a bite. It was juicy, but bland. No spices or seasonings. The beans were the same. The bread was a simple flat bread. I was happy to get it. I ate most of what was on the plate and drank the best wine I had ever had. Done. Now what is what is going on? What was that scream? We rescued that woman. She had been taken shortly after we took you. A group of men had been following us. He paused. Now, let me begin at who us is. We are a group of outcast travelers. A long time ago, we ran a traveling show. We would visit villages and scam the locals out of their money and jewels. And then we came to a small village that was, we did not know at the time, inhabited entirely by wizards and witches. We scammed the wrong people. They turned us into what we are today and placed a curse on us that makes us only able to survive off of raw female human flesh. And they have to be alive when we eat them. He paused. My eyes began to tear up and he continued. There's five of us left. We do not need much flesh to live. We can survive on one adult woman for a few months. We travel from village to village and collect one woman to feed us. A group of men found out about this and took advantage. They've been following us. They knock out the women and have their way with them. Then they drop them on our doorstep. We get them back to their home, but they think we did the attack. We only ever take one. We hate it, Claire. Four of my men starve to death rather than to participate. I'm too weak to do that. I'm too weak to let myself die. I was not, however, too weak to slaughter those men last night. Uh, Are you going to eat me? I said, my face now covered in tears and snot. I'm so sorry, Claire. I'm telling you this... Because I want you to be able to make peace with your God. I do not expect you to forgive us, Claire. But I do beg your forgiveness. This is the only way we can survive. Why can't it be someone else, I pleaded. I have a husband and my parents and siblings. Pick someone else with no family, please. Marcus, he will not be able to go on. We were going to have a family and grow old together. I haven't ever even had the joy of motherhood. I'm too young. Take someone old. The beast at the end of the table also had tears beginning to form in his grotesque eyes. Uh, I cannot. You know too much. If we I will were... not tell. I am an excellent liar. I will not speak a word. Claire, it has to be you. We cannot risk going in again. We are too weak from the hunger. (coughs) I have to drop my dinner. A few hours passed back in my cell. The guard knocked on the door. Have you made peace with your god? I am getting there. I said. 
I stared at the pouch of poison. Guard? Yes. How quick is it? I asked. We go for the neck first. I hate telling you this. It is very quick. You will not suffer for long. Can you knock me out first? I open the pouch. If you wish. We have a drink that can make you pass out, but I will be honest. Some women have still woken up after the first bite. The guard's voice choked a bit on the last words of his sentence. No one else will suffer this fate ever. I whispered and swallowed the poison. I stood up. I'm ready. Give me the knockout drink. We arrived at the dining hall. Four boar men sat around the table. Each of them with a sorrowful look on their faces. I felt the poison working. My guts churning. I began to sweat. Soon they would devour me. and All of our troubles would be over. I was ending the misery of so many. Marcus would never know. No one would. My vision was blurry. Hurry, let's get on with this. The oldest one jerked his head up with a start. We cannot eat her. I should have known, stupid. I can smell the poison. I was a dead woman, maybe minutes to live. The last thing I heard before I passed out. The poison sawing my heartbeat. The old, boar-faced man said, We agreed never to eat a pregnant one. Our artwork for this episode is from Giovanni Kosowski. His amazing artwork can be found at his DeviantArt page, linked to in the show notes at meetuspod.com. Please send all questions, concerns, or comments to feedback at meetuspod.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.